seem like you were demoing an ability because you didn't just mutate it when you did another death. You can mutate, you can redefine what a variable is assigned to, Right. but once it's assigned, um, you can't mutate it by virtue of doing an operation on it. So concatenating. So for example, if I do the other string, this concatenation uh, is done on other string, but not Apple. So Apple, other string, yeah, it's, those are, this returns a new variable. Uh, you need something to take care of the reload, or? Oh, so I'm compiling on the fly, and when I compile it, it it's attached to the same port, uh, same REPL. Um, yeah. Cool, so if I want to add all these numbers, you guys can see 10 down here. Uh, map increment, oops, sorry, wrong expression. So I just map increment through all that. I you're just the output in the bottom left corner. Oh, yeah, sorry, you guys, I'm standing on top. There you go. <coughs> <laughs> Uh, I can do lazy functions, so this is an infinite sequence because it's going to repeatedly call random int. Uh, I'll take the first 100 and stuff it into stuff. Uh, so if I do first, it's just accessing the first thing on there. Mm -hmm. It's actually going to return to, I can assign this to a new variable if I want. So let's evaluate in B variable. So A is first is stuff is this, A is A variable is this. 
uh, the variable it says. Um, and you could, when you have something like this, you could do recursion. So you could take like the first and rest. Um, so if I want to print all the things, have something like that. And I could also do it in my REPL. So let's say I want to change that functionality. I could hot swap, basically. I could print a space. And reevaluate this function. And when I re invoke it, it's the new function. So if you ever want to do continuous deployment or something, we'll go to recan. I swap the code. Anyway, uh, that's another lot of closure. This is a daytime talk. So, hopefully, you get a feeling of how closure is. Um, so, what's Datomic? It is a database that stores non rectangular um, non rectangular data. So let's put data or facts into this rectangle. Uh, my name is Felix, so that's a fact. Uh, my origin is Felix oh, Philippines. And my citizenship is the US. Right? And my office is Neo, relationship, let's just say I'm single. <laughs> uh, but, wow. but I can get married and say that I'm no longer single, right? But I'm now married. So the difference between Datomic and a normal database is that on a normal relational database, you would go into the relationship column and update single to married. And the fact that I was ever single is gone forever, right? With the atomic, to change the value of an entity, which is this rectangle, you just assert new data and retract the old data. So by doing that, you have access to the entire database at any given point in time. So you could say, give me the database as of this transaction number, and you can explore the entire database. Um, and you can even access the, the current database and the old database and act, pretend that they live together. So you can query across time, basically. Cool. And uh, it uh, also manages consistency. Um, so you can say an entity can have one name, right? So if I try to assert my name is Romeo, they'll say, no, you can't. There's only one per entity. Right? That's different from like, <coughs> Mongo or something where you just have a document and you can stuff whatever in there and you don't really know if it's consistent or, you know. But instead of, in the atomic, instead of saying that a person has one name. You say a thing can have a name. So you can you can create an entity that has an address, has a name, and has number of occupancy. And that entity can represent a hotel. Right? You never say hotel entity. You define those entities by what they're consistent with. So the same way that you don't, <coughs> there's no such thing as user. Like, are you a user? Are you a user? You're a person, right? And you're only a user by the context and where you belong and the attributes that you have. So you're a user because you have a username and password. You're not a user because you are What's it? a user. <laughs> a user. <laughs> right? Right. Unless I do drugs. Unless you do drugs, then it's a whole different talk. You might get killed in Singapore. Uh, okay, so it has a distributed architecture. So unlike different other databases, 
Uh, it doesn't live in one box. The, the database is actually spread across different domains. Um, it has this idea of peers. Peers are applications, basically. Uh, if you have a Clojure application or a Java application, the logic engine lives in your application and not the database. Uh, the database, sorry, I'm mixing up terminology. Um, the storage only contains the data, not necessarily the logic for your application. So all your queries are in your app. Storage could actually be any database or it can be memory. So you could use Postgres, Oracle, Mongo, almost any database uh, to be your storage engine for data. Um, so you can have many, many peers. And uh, you might notice that the direction is only up. So peers can only read from <laughs> From your uh, storage. Peter's on Peter. Peter. Peter could be a peer. Right? Um, if you want to write to your storage, you need to talk to something called a transactor. Um, a peer reaches <coughs> out and say, I want to I wanna state this new fact. All right? The transactor goes like, OK, uh, let me put that in for you. If it, if, if it, if it doesn't violate any of your schema rules, mm -hmm. right? So you could say like cardinality of any names or whatever. Um, and the storage replies back, okay, I wrote it. And then the transactor informs your peer and also informs all the other peers on a screen that this new data came in. And the, the peers <laughs> themselves can decide if I care about this data or not. Um, so that's that's how that's how you access data in data. Um, the cool advantage about this is that um, you have locality of data. So let's say you have a, a bunch of data in your system, uh, and you create a peer that's just doing analytics, and you can create another peer that's doing I don't know. Uh, permission management for your users. Uh, the peers themselves hydrate a cache. So as you're accessing data, it, it caches it for you. And if you're accessing the same kind of data, uh, you can hydrate your cache in such a way that you never have to cross over the network to access your data. It's actually in memory. And that's happening for you automatically. Uh, another advantage of this architecture is since your logic engine lives in the peer, you could use your query engine to query things from the database or things from your application, and you can actually execute application code in your query. Um, so unlike SQL where you create a string basically and shove it up the network and then you get a reply back, um, you can intermix your code and your query and your data from your application and your database in the same place. And it, it doesn't know any better. It's, it's agnostic to that. Uh, anyone know where the question is? It seems like I could get into trouble doing that. Because databases are awesome in that, or sorry, a traditional RDBMS is awesome in the sense that I can talk to it in SQL. And it's like, good, I have a query analyzer. I'm going to figure out exactly the right thing to do to be the most optimal, maybe, and I'm going to do it. Whereas if I'm doing all this in application land, all my queries are running on my app space, then I might just do stuff in a really inefficient way, right? So the onus becomes on me to know what the hell I'm doing and be smart about it. Right. Uh, it is. Um, you could get in a very dangerous situation where you're, you're like, do this query and it returns like a billion records. Um, there's no guards for that really built in. Um, you just have to be responsible. Um, the, the, the thinking here is that for the sake of flexibility and um, maintainability, uh, they keep it in the app, because uh, it's hard to test SQL, right, in isolation. Because the only way to test it is to actually do the query. Right? Uh, uh, as 
acid. Acid, it is acid. Um, so because you're doing all your transaction through the transactor, it's um, the uh, the reading from the storage is it, it could be uh, parallel, but every uh, write is synchronous. So th that could be a bottleneck, but you'd have to have a very huge app to actually uh, kill that. Um, we've had problems when we're importing a bunch of data from a dump. That's the only time we've actually reached the limits of the transaction. So uh, acid, but possibly resulting in race conditions. But that would you you would not write to the database the race uh, anything that the race conditions because it's synchronous on so the right. Right. Yes. Anyone else? Cool. But you also said that it's eventually consistent. It's always consistent. Always consistent. No race condition. Yeah. 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 You know what have Only one right. Since, since it's a synchronous right, you, you can't. You cannot have two things writing against each other. One of them will fail, and it'll fail uh, imagine noisily. So yep. that you know that it then you have fail. When you said consistent the first time around, I don't think you were talking about like consistency in the yeah. Uh, network. The peers. Yes. yes. Um, right. Yeah. Not like the the peers. The peers are consistent almost instantly, though, because there's a stream that comes out of the transactor that, that notifies you whenever a new fact get a fact is introduced to. Uh, Unless there's like a net split. Expired latency or all yeah. the things that can go wrong with the distributed system. Right. 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 Latency will happen. Yeah. Cool. Okay, so where does it run? In the cloud. Uh, so I just, <laughs> like I just said, it's in, uh, it's in, uh, it has a distributed uh, infrastructure, so you can actually, uh, you can run this in EC2 or in your in your laptop or anywhere because the transactor is just automatically where the it looks and your app doesn't really need to know that. Um, every time you need to know <coughs> about your data, you go through the transactor. So, yeah. And in, in memory, where does the transactor it, uh, it's a it's a separate instance. It's a it's a service. App. Yeah, it's a service app. Okay. Um. In memory is also great because if you're running a test, you could create a database and dump the database every time you run your test suite or a test case. Uh, I've actually been doing this, and you think it's really slow, but it's surprisingly fast. But you shouldn't probably rely on that. If you have pictures and stuff, you could actually show them in the database. And dump it. There's something that's like like the you were talking about storing code and data. That is possible to. Did I pick that up wrong? Uh, you can do that, but I, I don't think I said that. Um, <laughs> you can store procedures inside the atomic database, but what I was saying is that the query engine lives in your application. It's a it's a closure library, so you can implement functions that. Leverage the query engine or queries that leverage the functions that you write. We cannot of because we cannot be able. It's not something that we put together. You can. You you can you can you can store a function into the database mm -hmm. and execute it. It's not, I'm, I'm thinking of it in terms of like you know, in an object database. You would put an object with functionality into the database, and it would also have state. Oh, so no. the, the idea of the closure is that things are statements. Yeah. And so that's why I'm a little bit confused. So, I'm, I'm not talking about the state. So, so um, there's an idea of putting function in data I mean, and setting that inside the data store. But we could also store state and values with it as in data. Oh, no, they're separate. Okay. You store a function, you store data yeah, somewhere else. Somewhere else. Okay. Um, there's actually a value type called function. Okay. Uh, and there's a value type for all the other things. That makes sense. Yeah. Cool. So why does it exist? 
maybe I can do some demo and show you guys what it's about. Great. Because I'm sick of storing rectangular data and I want to put my triangle somewhere. Exactly. <laughs> That's why it's so cool. Um, all right, so we're just going to start a new namespace. Uh, let me switch to that namespace. Does anyone have any random questions before I? Can I let's say you said you can use something like Postgres as your store. Mm -hmm. If I was using something like Postgres as the PostGIS extensions, can I leverage the PostGIS extensions? So, or does it treat it as a dump data store? Yeah, it dumps blobs in there. Okay. You can't really, yeah, right. you can't use like active record and data. So. All right, so I just evaluated this namespace, and now I have a namespace that requires the atomic API. So this is what I was saying about the pure, like, the atomic API is a atomic library um, that contains the query engine. Uh, and then I'm defining a URL, which says that this is a in memory. Uh, create the database. Oops, I must have already created it. Let me just create a new one because I've, I've already executed this. So, this is a way for you to check. Um, if the database exists to, if you try to create it and it returns false, that means it already exists. But I just want to start off clean without having to kill my REPL. Alright, so I created a database, I connect to it, and um, so. I have this schema, so like I was saying, um, you could define the attributes that you could store in Datomic. You have to define the things that you're storing in the database. So uh, I'm saying here that I'm storing an attribute called name. It's a string, has cardinality one, and this is just instruction instruction for Datomic to say that we're going to install this into the database. Uh, so this is an email, it's a string, RNLA many, and we're going to install it in the database. And why string RNLA one? Unless you're in a different country. Or... <laughs> <laughs> All right. Oops. So I just slurped and read in the schema and stopped it in the database. So now we should be able to feed a transact using this connection. Hey, look, we have some emails. <laughs> So there, and I could query for that, DQ, so before I can query the database, I need to get a database, right? Uh, DB, using this connection. Sorry. Okay, so. 
So unlike SQL, when you're trying to interact with Datomic, you actually get the database as a value. So this depth database, this is the entire database as a variable. So, <laughs> yeah. so it, it's smart, right? It's not. Yeah. But you can treat it as if it's a value. Uh, it's it's hybrided. Uh, awesome. I'm wondering if you remember to sacrifice a sheep to the uh, demo gods. <laughs> I am not sure why this is returning nothing. Should I then give you uh, an ID? I think it's ident, right? Not ID. Is it ident or ID? Sorry, 
not sure why this is not consulting. Uh, yeah. I might have to stop. I'm not sure why it's not connecting. We can pretend it works. I can pretend it worked with that. This is the rest of the talk. I didn't see. I've that heard was, it. That one's not working. Sorry. That's fine. Why don't you switch to the one that you wrote earlier? The Sarah yeah, Does that one work without the other policy there? Uh, no, that was actually. There's five monthly files. This is actually for some other talk where. I, mean, I can talk about this. Mm -hmm. um, so this is trying to explain like how the datomic schema works. Um, so I'm trying to demonstrate here that you can't just. Um, transact something into the database without actually defining it into schema. So here I just try to transact a DB ident of uh, .doe and email without actually defining a schema. So in order for that to actually work, you'd have to uh, define the schema like we did by slurping the schema, and now you can transact this uh, back. Why are you sometimes saying ID and sometimes saying ID? So, DB ID is just the, the ID that Datomic generates for you. Uh -huh. Whereas DB ID is an alias that you can use to find that entity. Oh. So, you could just query John Doe and then it'll return this entity to you. A natural key. Yeah. And here, okay, and here I'm actually demonstrating that you can query for entities and you could even query for the entity that represents the database. So like you were asking what the difference is between dbid and id. Uh, db dot part db is just a alias for entity zero. So that would return the same. Same. So your first entity is yourself. Yep. And so I didn't really talk about this because I didn't have a chance to, but every fact that you store in the atomic is called a datum. Um, and it has uh, five attributes to entity ID. Uh, it actually has the attribute name and attribute value and uh, transaction and if it's in the cert or a retract. Okay. So the entity ID is like the Felix entity and then the attribute name would be like name and then the value would be Felix. Transaction ID is every time you do a transaction it increments the ID and then a retract number uh, a cert would be, I am married, I am single, I retire, I am married, and then I cert. And so, go ahead. No, the DQ that you have that, that you wrote here. Right here? Mm -hmm. Okay. So, I should talk about the query. Uh, Datomic uses data log, which kind of just does pattern matching. Like I was saying, uh, every fact in Datomic is a datum. Right? So, the first thing is the entity ID, the, and the attribute name, attribute value, and then transaction and assert would be the other things uh, that does not show up here. 
because you could omit the last things that aren't needed to make your query more refined. And it just matches the shape of that data. So in here I'm saying find a data that has the shape uh, variable ID, it could be any ID, but has the attribute email that has the value of Sarah. Okay. Right. And use the database to find that. Okay. Why don't we have the second and yeah, that one? Right, and then the second argument is an implicit join. So join on the DBID, right, because they match, and find DBI done, and assign that to this variable. Which and actually, that's what I want back. Right. Okay. And so how does it know to match Sarah example to email? Uh, is that just because it's the first thing to pass it? Like, if I want to pass two things. You can pass as many things as you want here. Yeah. Um, and you can just decide, yeah. like... Exactly, so it's the yeah, same one, thing. right? Sarah is going to email and feel like it's going to something because it's right. the first to appear. Right, so this, this in actually matches. This dollar is database. And this, a variable value could be... Um, is the demarcated by a question mark. So you can have as many of those as you want. And you can actually have as many data sources as you want. So another data source. Yeah, that's a new oh. cost data source so we get these stories. Right. Is there a way for you to give those keys, uh, so Sarah at example.com, those query values uh, keys, like symbolic names, so that I don't have to know that Sarah is mapping to email and Felix is mapping to something else because the order matters, like a name parameter. Oh no, rep. It has to be in the diff, but in like a function. Is that what you're sort of saying? Closure on it. It has to be the same order here. That yeah, I'm just saying. Like I wish I could write like email. I wish I could pass a, a map for the last you, argument. I would just define a new function that closure on it. Yeah. Yeah, but there is no built-in way to do that. That's okay. Um, yeah, and then you could, you could, you could say like, I don't care about the MDID, ID, just find me all the emails in the database, and it'll return to you. Yeah. Very much it. There's more to the topic, but I just wanted to give you guys a quick overview. So who's using this in production and why? Um, there's one called Rookie that's using it to find the best hotel values for you. Um, I'm not really sure why they went with with Datomic specifically, aside from the fact that they thought it was nifty. nifty. Yeah. Um, on paper, why am I supposed to use this? On paper. So, the cool thing about Datomic, and I didn't really get to it, because of my little fail, uh, is that you can treat it as a relational database, uh, key value store, or graph database, just depending on how you access the information based on your query. So you could you could query based on attribute, right? Which is what a graph database is. You can say like, give me all the people that go to location. That, that's the value of the location that they go to. Or you can access a relational database by... How is that efficient? Like, how does, like, graph database, I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This so, it's very interesting to me. So, graph database like, is designed to know you're going to query on that thing, so I'm going to keep that index hot and ready to go. Whereas, if I haven't told it that, and I say, tell me all the people who go to the, the, the chicken rice place, so, how does it figure that out? So they talk about actually indexes for you, mm -hmm. all the attributes and all like Elasticsearch. Yeah. Okay. So it indexes. Well, not Elasticsearch, but it has another search for something like Elasticsearch for for text search, but it's how we But it indexes all the attributes and ID IDs and all the attributes for you as you put it. In. So 
it actually jumps to that index and then it knows what entities uh, point to that. So it's not just randomly broken. Yeah. So I think that's like a, I mean I'll, I'll tell you one of the, the first thing that jumped out that was like really exciting was this whole idea of like rolling the network basically being able to tell the exact instances data database at a point in time. Uh, especially like you know I had to build about three or four complex ERP systems where they like okay so what happened you know, like what happened two years back on this like you know for instance how is this like huge project changing over time? So for me that's a really amazing problem feature. But again, other than that, that's sort of uh, something. You can often fix that in other databases, like back in databases like Mongo, tensor catch and beef. But in particular, yeah, I kind of like what what particular problem does this solve that say you wouldn't be able to do with one of the most specialized databases like this? It does seem really cool. But you know, I'm assuming it's developed for a specific to solve a specific problem that couldn't be solved in another way. So I think that's kind of my question. Like right, what 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 superpowers does so, this you didn't have? I don't know if it if it's a superpower, but I, I feel like the way the Atomic implemented, uh, the way it organizes information is a lot simpler than most databases. So everything in the Atomic is just the data, right? There's no higher, there, there's no higher object or idea apart from that. Right? Um, and the fact that you don't have to decide up front that you want a graph database or you want you want something that can travel back in time, it just does that because of how it's implemented. Um, makes me feel more comfortable because I don't really know what I can want in the future. It's cool. I just you know, in a sense I'm just not I I am I'm, I'm intrigued by the, the, the idea that I which probably is way too in-depth functional discussion of wrapping datums in, in enclosures and functor and functors to communicate how my data is being processed, retrieved, and graphed transparently at, at runtime for me. Like without seeing it. The fact that everything is a data and that it's a function programming language and I just need to change my tree and add a fun uh, function or wrap or closure on something and then does that this is going back to the earlier statement saying that it doesn't it doesn't know the difference in the fact that the data store it's just it's just closure with, with data in memory. Um, I mean so I'm very interested in seeing how when I have big big data and my whole database is in memory as a function pointer, how that allows me to Complicated functional stuff on my data live. Sorry, that, that was a very rambling statement that didn't quite end up in the question that I was intending to ask. Uh, is it if I wanted to put closures around each of these statements uh, that you were talking earlier and then pass them in so that when I'm asking for my data, I can everything has the closure around it and I can be mutating my data live. Is that a trivial? Yeah. Um, so the thing is, you have an immutable version of the database. Mm -hmm. It's not actually changing from underneath you, yeah. right? But, I, but I, I'm, it's being filtered through whatever I pass through. It's being transformed in the right. functional sense. Yeah. And I can swap those transforms out willy-nilly. You can, yeah. I'm not sure if you guys really missed it, but is it transactional? Oh, right, yes. Yeah. So all of these uh, transactions are uh, atomic. Yeah. And if, if you so evaluate it. It's a set of operations that affect the fact that all at once or not. Yeah, so when you, when you transact it, it verifies that you're not violating any of the cardinality like rules that you put in your schema. And is it blocking so that nobody else can fuck with the data that I just read when I want to update? Yeah, all, all data writes are synchronous. Sure. And you can update multiple entities at the same time? One yeah. transaction? Yeah. Well, you can up, update multiple datums 
an entity, sorry, an entity doesn't actually exist as an idea. As an idea. It's just uh, it's a, it's just a join on the first column of the data, which they're treating as the ID of the. We think they are passing that cycle. Uh, so yeah, sorry, we have yeah, we have. So it's all one question. Uh, can you use another language like Clojure? Yeah, uh, you can use Java. Um, and I don't know. <laughs> like JavaScript? <laughs> um, I'm not sure of any other languages that use it. Thank you, Felix. Thank you.